it in. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to your point of contact for the kingdom of God. I am Pastor Dumas A. Harshaw, Jr., coming to you from First Baptist Church. We are located at 101 South Wilmington Street in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, where we are overjoyed that you have come to be with us for this spiritual journey and to join us for a worship experience and to thank God for God's goodness and God's presence and God's power. And so we pray that the Lord will bless you, will bring strength to your life and your journey. And we know that God works miracles. We stand upon the word of God. We believe in the kingdom power, presence, and ethics. And we also are people of faith. We do not live by fear because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind according to his promise and his word. And so we move forward uh, with that assurance. And we encourage you to invite someone or share this word with someone who might need a word from the Lord. Uh, we ask again for your prayer support and we seek out your financial support as well for the ministry that goes on here at First Baptist that touches lives across the globe. Uh, we say to the Lord, have thine own way on this day. As we open the word of God, stand on the promises of God, and surrender our lives to the Lordship of Christ. I invite you to share with me in, uh, the book of 2 Timothy, and in particular the fourth chapter, verses 6 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. And there in the New International Translation uh, of the original language, we find these words. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the 
crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the application of his awesome word. Uh, will you pray with me for a moment? Dear eternal God, our heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this day you've given unto us as a gift of life and an opportunity to serve and an opportunity to remember just how good you are and how you have saved us, are saving us, and how you shall save us in days ahead. Lord, bless your word to our hearts. May it lift someone today. May it set someone free today. May it encourage someone's heart. And may it remind all of us uh, what thus saith the Lord. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, after giving a final charge to uh, his mentee and the servant leader, the young pastor of the early church, uh, this final charge, uh, the Apostle Paul encourages him to follow good leadership, uh, to highly regard the Word of God, and also to keep to the tradition of preaching and, and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in all that it means. And on top of that, then the apostle gives a testimony, his testimony uh, in this portion of God's word. It has become evident that Paul would not escape execution. Execution for his commitment to the truth of the gospel his commitment to ministry, and his preaching and his teaching and his influence to bring together people around the cross, but also the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so now he reflects upon the impact of, of his life choices. And so the, the thought came to me in describing this, uh, this particular time in the life of the apostle, this season, uh, of his ministry, uh, it came to mind the notion of unpleasant preparations, unpleasant preparations. And we're accustomed to that in our own life and in our own world, and particularly during this time of uh, the various forms and evolutions of the pandemic where well, it's been very unpleasant for many people, and yet we're, we're stuck in a pattern of preparing to, to get our children off to school. We are preparing for social events, for weddings and graduations and sports events and entertainment events, for visiting restaurants and doing so much more, and even worship experiences. And, uh, it's unpleasant to have to RSVP. It's unpleasant to have to make sure you have your mask with you and you wash your hands and you socially distance yourself from other people. And, and so it's unpleasant. It's unpleasant when you travel and, and you have to carry a vaccination card. And it's unpleasant to worry about who's sitting next to you as you prepare to have an experience in another place and in another location. And uh, these uh, unpleasant preparations in the deepest sense are part uh, not only of the story with the apostle, but a part of our own, our own lives when we think of home. And it's unpleasant when you become accustomed to your son or daughter, your children being present, and now you have to prepare for their departure to go to college or to start their own families. And even though you want them to move on and develop, there's a period where it's unpleasant to cut off one kind of reality and one kind of knowing a person or being close to a person and then releasing them into their future. And the same is true for our own lives when we've lived, into, lived in a household for so many decades and we have collected so much across uh, those years. And then it's unpleasant when circumstances are that we have to uh, close down that place uh, of existence and that habitat. 
uh, that house and then, and then move on to something else. Um, and so we, we're dealing with unpleasant realities all the time in the flow of life and in the journey of life. When we are preparing for surgical procedures, it's unpleasant to have to prepare with a doctor sometimes what you have to do in order to be ready for surgery. Uh, it's unpleasant what you have to eat or not eat as a result uh, of preparing for, for that time. And it's unpleasant for students when they are reaching for, seeking to grasp achievement by uh, obtaining a degree. And it's unpleasant uh, uh, to spend so many hours preparing for exams, taking exams, and yet the larger goal is before you uh, because you want to finish that course of study and you certainly want that degree. Uh, but it's unpleasant sometime along the way. And these are simple illustrations of how we can relate in one sense to the story with the, uh, the apostle as, as he now is beginning to step into a whole uh, new reality. And it brings to mind to me uh, the hymnist who wrote, um, lead me, guide me, because that is a prayer that we need sometimes when these changes of life are taking place. And in the words of that hymn, I am weak and I need thy strength and power to help me over my weakest hour. Lead me through the darkness, thy face to see. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. Help me tread in the paths of righteousness. Be my aid when Satan and sin oppress. I am putting all my trust in thee. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. And I love the chorus where it says, lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stray. Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. And this particular phrase, I am lost if you take your hand from me. I am blind without thy light to see. Lord, just always to me thy servant be. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. Lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stray. Lord, lead me. L let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. Imagine in his heart the apostle uh, certainly turned to uh, that kind of a prayer as he was writing this letter and as he was in passing the baton to another generation of Christian leaders and church members and disciples of Christ and those who would carry on that message that he has given his life for, that Jesus died for the sins of all the world. He died on an old rugged cross, but he rose again the third day, and he's living in the hearts of people who say yes to his will. And, and now he is ready uh, to go on to what God has arranged for him. And first, in, uh, in this story, we see that the apostle is not afraid. He's not afraid to die for the cause of Christ. He is not afraid of what tomorrow will bring. He has no fear that all the work that he's devoted his life to will be lost. He simply lives in a place of trusting in God and believing in the promises of the Lord and allowing God to have God's way in his life. And so he describes this portion of saying yes to his destiny uh, as perhaps he prayed many times that it was changed and yet he knew in his heart of hearts that God said, this is the way, walk ye in it. And he says that, his life is being poured out like a drink offering in reference to the Old Testament custom. And so he identifies his own giving of his life for the cause of Christ in line with that biblical tradition. 
And he, de he declares that, that his time is short, his demise is coming, and he must face what he will face. But he knows that the Lord has prepared his heart for this hour, uncomfortable, unpleasant, and yet the reality of his own uh, walk with Christ. But again, he says that he's ready to go. He's ready to meet his Savior. And he has complete confidence in the promises of God. He is living uh, by faith at this time. And, and he knows for those who receive Christ as Lord and Savior, according to what he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, he says, Therefore, we are always confident and know that it's, as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And the same words that he wrote to the church and to the believers now are the words that become wings for him as he moves into this destiny. And how grateful we are for God's promises and God's word that, that then uh, give us power along the way when we too go through transitions in life. And life is filled with change and transition for each and every one of us. You're not going to stay whatever age you are today. You will age. You will mature. You're not going to always be working in that job. You're not going to always be living in that neighborhood. And for some, you're not always going to be in that relationship and, and, and yet there's a God who provides a stable foundation to take us from one place to another place to his glory and empowers us in the midst of it all so we can live with faith and assurance that the Lord will see us through and that's the kind of faith that then empowered the servant of God so that he was prepared for this unpleasant reality and yet rejoicing that on the other side of it was the glory of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God for his life. That takes a lot of faith. And second, we see that, that Paul clearly understands the meaning of a life of dedication and a life of passion for the things of God. He has given his life from a young person that was awakened uh, in his uh, religious slumber uh, by the hand of God. His life was transformed and he was changed by the blood of the lamb and the power of Christ. And since that time that his eyes were open, he decided like the song says, I will follow Jesus. Have you decided to follow him? And he said, I will follow Christ for the rest of my existence. And he knew as a result of that, that there were benefits that were his. And not only his alone, but every believer in God's call upon your life. And the meaning of discipleship. And what it means to be born anew and walk in a new life because of what God has done for you. And he understood that. And so in his testimony, he rehearses that. And it's not bragging, but it's simply telling the truth of the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. But it might sound like bragging, as in Paul clearly understands the meaning of a dedicated life, a life that is passionate for the things of the Lord. And so he cries out in gratitude for all that the Lord has done in his complicated life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And again, it's not being braggadocious, but it's simply telling the truth because of the grace of God in his life. And he said, I started to follow Jesus and I kept it all the way through. And now I'm dying for the cause of Christ. But I have fought the good fight. I didn't fight with weapons of warfare in a natural sense. I didn't run around doing drive-bys and killing folk. I didn't murder anybody in my own home. I didn't kill my spouse or my children. Uh, I didn't destroy my neighbor's life. 
Um, I didn't do any of that, but I, I fought a fight nonetheless. The fight of the forces of good against the forces of evil. I fought with the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have fought with my testimony of what God has done in my life. I have fought with the power of faith against despair, hopelessness. I have fought a good fight. And every time there was encroachment into my territory by the enemy, I kept fighting the devil. I kept fighting that which was wrong. I fought in the midst of temptation. I, I, I called upon the Lord for help. So I fought that good fight. And he says, and I, I have finished my course, my race. I have finished what was marked out for my life. So many of us get so busy wondering about what other people are doing and looking at somebody else's life and worrying about what they have and what you don't have and wondering about competition as a believer against some other ministry and some other outpouring of the Lord. And Paul said, I didn't waste time with any of that, but I finished what God gave me to do. I finished my course. I have a race all by myself between me and the Lord, and he says, I have finished my race. It's the destiny that God had for me. And sometimes we can get sidetracked in comparison Christianity and worrying about keeping up with somebody else and worrying about what other folk are doing, and we forget about what God has called us to do and destined for us. We don't know how many decades we have. We don't know how many years we have. That's why it's best to live to the fullest every single day. Some people die young and impact the entire world. Uh, some people live in, uh, up into to, to old age and never touch anybody's life. Uh, some people die in the midst of their middle years or they're providing for family and they're right in the midst of their career. And some people are blessed in other ways uh, to live long, fruitful lives. We don't know what God has in mind and we don't know what the future holds. That's why every day is a day of salvation. Every day is a day of jubilee. Every day is a day of celebration. Every day is a day to work for the Lord, to do what you're meant to do in this world because tomorrow is not yours or mine and it is not promised. And so Paul says, I can't deal with the past, that's over now. I can't deal with the future because that's in God's hands. But one thing I can do is finish what God has asked me to finish. And so he said, I have finished my race. And then he says, in addition to that, I have kept the faith. And in that, we just think about the things that happened in his life and the assaults on his character and the attempts to murder him and to take him out and the infiltration of enemies in his own ministry and all that he did and all that he had to confront. A family of heritage that denounced him and left him alone in the world because he decided to accept Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he says in essence, but in the midst of all of that, and from all accounts, we understood that Paul was single. But in the midst of all of that, whatever I lost, I counted as glory for the Lord. And I have kept the faith. Through it all, I kept believing in the goodness of the Lord. Through it all, I kept trusting in God's word. Through it all, I stood on the promises of God and let God be God in my life. I kept believing, even though I had questions about what God did and what God doesn't do and God's time frame of doing what I've asked him to do. And yet I kept the faith. I had those throwing rocks at me and I had haters along the way. And yet I kept believing I kept my faith in God and I stopped believing even in myself and all of my hubris, my pride and my human ambition and achievement. I really thought I was somebody, but because of what I've been through bearing the cross of Christ, uh, I don't believe in myself, but I believe in the God who saved me. I believe in the God who's inside of me. I believe in a God who loves me with an everlasting love. 
And he says, I count it as just trash, all that ambition and trying to compete with other folk and to do almost anything for attention and for fame and for money. He said, I left all of that behind and I kept believing that God is a savior. Jesus is a redeemer. The Holy Spirit is a power. And I've seen God move in a mighty way. I have kept my faith in God. I kept the faith. And so then, as we see and hear a life committed to what God can do, well, then he extends the promise and he knows indeed that it's not only for him. And the third point is that Paul now looks to all believers and he said, I was not the only one, but, but, but all believers and all those who work for the kingdom's sake and all of those who are preaching an unpopular gospel and all of those who are singing the songs of Zion in order to bless somebody, all of those who engage in mission work around the world, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, building and securing and saving and salvaging and redeeming for the cause of Christ. We all will receive what God has promised. So it's not just a solitary, isolated relationship with God, the apostle asserts that I have, but everybody who decides to follow the Lord, everybody who surrenders their will into the hand of God, everybody who's willing to accept Christ fully into their hearts and into their lives, are standing as beneficiaries of a reward through the kingdom work that will bring glory to the name of God. And so he says that he said, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, who is the righteous judge, he sees in us and he sees through us and he knows who we truly are. He knows the background story. He knows what we have denied ourselves of. He knows the midnight hour striving. He knows when you've been walking the floor in tears, praying to the Lord. He knows when your own family has turned their back on you. He knows when you lost a marriage simply because you wanted to be a preacher of the gospel. He knows what you had to sacrifice and friendships no longer popular and on the who's who list because you decided to link up with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He knows because he's the righteous judge and he will award to me on that day and then quickly he follows, but not to me only. It's not just about me. It's not just about Paul. It's not just about my ministry. It's not just about my church. It's not just about my brand. It's not just about my name. But everybody, whoever is longing for his appearing, will be blessed by the coming, the second coming of Christ. Be blessed by the time when the Lord intervenes in history and snatches your life from this world to the other world. He says, everybody will receive that crown who've been touched by the blood of the Lamb. Everyone who suffered for the gospel. Everyone who's bleeding because of the cross. Everyone who believes in the gospel then we'll receive the crowns that God has set aside for God's people. Hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, there are unpleasant preparations, but everything's going to be all right because as we turn it over to the Lord, God will have God's way and Jesus will reign and the power of God's Holy Spirit will be present. And the Lord... Hallelujah. The Lord, hallelujah, will see us through. And we give his name praise. We give his name glory. We give him the praise he deserves. And it is in the name, the majestic name of Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. And we invite you to open your heart and open your life to the reality of God. You can't be prepared if you have not been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You cannot be prepared for what this world is to face or what the next reality holds unless you are linked with what God is doing in the world and you know God for yourself. 
And I love the way the song says it to him. Time after time, the Savior is waiting. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. Why don't you answer him? And the chorus goes on to say, time after time he has waited before, my God, and now he is waiting again for you and me to see if you are willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. If you'll take one look at the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him and all of your darkness will end. Within your heart, he'll abide. And again, don't turn him away. How he wants to come into your heart, into your heart, if you are willing today. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we don't want you to wait any longer for us and all of our commitments around you, before you. We don't want you to have to wait any longer for the completeness of our dedication and, and our opening of our hearts and our minds to your reality, to your purpose. Forgive us for making you wait for us, Lord, while we have spent sometimes years doing what we want to do, doing our own thing. But now you can bring light in the midst of our hearts and we receive you as Lord and as Savior. Lord, we pray for those who need that closer walk with you. We pray for those who need a second chance. We pray for those who need a new beginning. We pray for those who need to be saved, who need redemption, those who need help with their minds, their spirits, their bodies, their work, oh Lord. We pray for those who are on the devil's team who need to come off. Lord, we pray for those who are locked in addictions and those who are in prisons of one form or another. Lord, send your freedom to their hearts and we know that you want to enter in. Come, oh Lord, into our hearts. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. O oh God who created us, take our lives today that you might be everything that we need and desire. And for all that you've done, we give your name praise. And we're excited about what you're going to do tomorrow. And we simply say, have thine own way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Beloved, I am blessed to be able to join you for this time of sharing announcements and prayer requests and also to celebrate with those who are celebrating. And uh, we rejoice for this uh, opportunity and this time to speak to the members of First Baptist Church, 101 South Wilmington Street in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, first of all, I uh, just want to share the announcement and invite you to join uh, us and in invite friends to join us for a year-long celebration of the Silver Pastoral Jubilee, which is anniversary beginning Sunday in this phase, uh, September 26, uh, 2021 at 4 o'clock p.m. on social media or virtually. Uh, the speaker is a friend and a brother, uh, Reverend Alvin Tunstill, Jr., who will be speaking uh, from Trinity Baptist Church in uh, Los Angeles, California. And just want to take uh, this moment uh, to express gratitude, and I'm going to read two things to you uh, that uh, is listed in uh, our newsletter uh, that's gone out this week. And, this one is, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are richly blessed by the initial recognition of my 25th silver anniversary as pastor of First Baptist Church. Shannon and I are greatly inspired by the wonderful expressions of love and support, the special prayers, cards, gifts, poems, inspirational words, and monetary gifts have brought us much cheer. We love you and are grateful to God for bringing us together and keeping us for so long. Special thanks to the pastoral ministry team under the leadership of Deacon Gladys Walker for planning of events and uh, dedicated leadership for this year of Jubilee. May the Lord bless you and make his face to shine upon you, Pastor and Mrs. Harshaw. And also, uh, Returning to worship, we invite your prayers and cooperation as plans are underway to return to in-person worship services beginning October the 3rd, 2021. We will conduct a socially distanced modified service at 8 a.m. in the Family Life Center and an 11 a.m. modified service in the church sanctuary. Uh, all established precautions as outlined in the guidelines to reopen First Baptist Church document, which is, has, has appeared in the newsletter for weeks, uh, will be in use, including welcoming the vaccinated who are willing to wear a mask and abide under the specific procedures. You, be, you, will, be, you will be receiving more details as we approach the first Sunday of October, Pastor Harshaw. We want to take time to celebrate with uh, September babies, uh, James Scott, September 1, Deborah Leach, September 2nd, Charles McCall, September 2nd, Marie Palmer, September 2nd, uh, Clarence Salter, September 3rd, Dwight Spencer, September 5th, Reverend Philip Broyles, September 6th, Trustee Earlene Briggs, September 6th, Clintus Noble, September 8th, Sonia Nicole Mem, September 8th, uh, Mary Salter, September 10th, uh, Trustee James Howard, September the 11th, Reverend Muriel Dunn, September 14th, Denise Shaw, September 18th, Trustee Paulette Smith, September 19th, Deacon Leon Bunch, September 20th, and Sister Leola Davis, September 28th. And we say happy anniversary to Deacon Hank and Reverend Cynthia Maddox, uh, uh, September 22nd for their 20th wedding anniversary, uh, to Bobby and Cardron Gill, September 24th for their 55th wedding anniversary, Benny and Ruby Mem, September 30th for their 55th wedding anniversary. And at this time, we want to uh, share prayer requests and. Uh, direct your attention in scripture to 1 Thessalonians, um, the fifth chapter in particular, um, and uh, verses 16 and following. It says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will 
for you in Christ Jesus. And so by public prayer, we're following the word. And by celebrating with those who have had very important events take place in their lives, we're following the word. And, uh, and so we, we bow for a word of prayer. But as we pray, we pray for the Ozella Burgess family. as She went on to be with the Lord and will be eulogized uh, on Wednesday. Also, we pray, continue prayers for Tyler Day, Pearl Fowler, Doris Bridges Harris, Dorothy Jones, Elaine Powell, Mary Louise Salter, Margaret Wilson. If you have a prayer request for someone uh, in particular you'd like for us to pray about, if you get that information to us, uh, we'll be happy to include that name. We continue to pray for Hattie Baysmore and also Adrian and uh, Daphne and the entire family at the loss of Randy. Um, we continue to pray for the D. Keene family the entire King family and uh, Larry King Jr. and uh, the family's loss. And uh, also we pray for Mary Carter and family. Uh, we also are lifting up Charles and Deshelle and Bobby Haywood and their family today. Uh, we're praying for Reverend Bill Burge and his daughter today. We pray today for the children uh, in the schools where children are uh, being quarantined and uh, some are uh, having COVID-19 experiences and illnesses. We pray for children across the country who are in hospitals. We pray for those who are caring for them, the nurses and doctors and the, and the caring and hospital uh, communities uh, that are really stretched and we think of people who don't have COVID-19 who have been scheduled for surgeries and have emergencies while all of this is going on and finding a bed in the hospital is difficult. We pray for the, them and we pray for their families in a special way. Uh, we certainly remember uh, also Sister Pearlie Gill who had a successful surgical procedure and we thank God for uh, we pray for Vernon in a special way. We pray for the Bradley uh, family, Edith and Ishmael, and what the family uh, has been through. We pray for the Leach family also. And continue to pray for Brooklyn and Zoe, uh, two young people, and the Myers family. Um, so let us uh, bow in prayer and uh, stand on God's word and ask God for help. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you that you're a prayer answering God, that you're a God who shows up in trouble and difficulty and pain, and even in the times of loss, oh God, tragedy, and even in the times of traumatic experiences, Lord. And we thank you that you are present with us. We pray for the whole world. We pray for the nation. We pray for families one after another who are going through trials and tribulations and difficulties and pain. And, and you know the reality of those who need comfort, oh God, and those who need strength. We pray especially for our educators and administrators and parents and children relative to simply seeking an education protect them is our prayer be with them in a mighty way and for all these families and needs that we have lifted before you we ask that you would move in a mighty way oh god we believe you're god all by yourself we know nothing is impossible to those who believe we believe in you and we're witnesses that you answer prayer and you move in mighty ways and for all of our doubts and fears and anxieties we place in your hands and know that everything will be all right. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you.